Tonight, if you want to go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 20, maybe you can put a bookmark in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Those are the two accounts in the Old Testament where we find the listing of the ten words, the ten commandments. And uh, last week we gave an introduction to this law code very quickly. And then we looked at the first command, uh, wherein God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me or beside me. The word can mean kind of a both and situation that's reflected in the two different renderings in Exodus and uh, Deuteronomy in most versions. Uh, really that commandment uh, is the source or the, if you want to say, kind of the mother of all of the other commands. That's where it has to start. And if you could imagine a world where everyone submitted and subscribed to that reality, that there would be only one God and that we would all submit uh, to Him. Think about how uh, that command uh, gives us, for instance, the basis for equality. Today, equality is a big word. I know you hear that thrown around in a lot of different settings, um, whether that's political or educational or uh, sociological. People talk about equality, and equality is a good thing. And uh, Paul would build on this idea in Acts chapter 17 when he said it's God who made everything. Not the God that you worship here in Athens in these temples and shrines that you have constructed, but the God who truly made the world, the universe, and everything in it has made of one blood all the nations, all the races of people. We're all equal because we are all made in the image of the one God. He is the creator of us all. Uh, consequently, we're all equal in that sense. Uh, in the same way, the moral code, the moral expectations that God has of us does not differ from person to person or group to group or place to place or time to time. Uh, that remains uh, the same because God is our God. Well, the Ten Commandments, uh, again, we talked about their uh, setting in the Old Testament and we briefly just discussed, of course, their meaning and usage for today and noted how, and we will continue to do this, how the New Testament reiterates uh, these same expectations that God has for us today. Uh, I didn't do a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, spectating or watching uh, some of the old uh, comedy routines of George Carlin, as I understand they're quite vulgar, but I ran across uh, this quote that he had, and so if you'll pardon some of the things that he said that probably weren't worth repeating, uh, maybe this one at least gives us pause to consider. He said, the real reason we can't have the Ten Commandments in a courthouse, you can't post, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not lie in a building full of lawyers, judges, and politicians. It creates a hostile work environment. Well, that, maybe that makes you chuckle a little bit, and maybe uh, that is to some degree uh, true. But tonight, commandment number two, you shall not make... For yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, thousands of generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to seven or verses four to six excuse me my first interaction with an individual that actually was an idol worshiper uh, happened when I arrived um, in the fall of 1997 at Freed Hardeman that same uh, year a uh, student from Nigeria uh, the best that I could make out the enunciation of his name was Abimliaku Doka I could say Doka pretty well Abimliaku he he kind of rolled all of those syllables together, but he said, just call me Doka for short. Uh, and that was simple enough. But uh, he had come from Nigeria. He had um, uh, been able to study uh, through World Bible School, uh, the program that we actually use through Crossville Bible Study still today. Of course, uh, we do most of our studies online. He actually did it by postal uh, route. And uh, he uh, became, uh, he was able to know um, through that study and became acquainted with what the New Testament taught about God and about uh, Jesus and the wonderful news of the gospel and rendered obedience to it. And um, through some other contacts with uh, American missionaries, they had made provision where he could come uh, to America and study and did uh, study and graduate from Freed Hardeman. But uh, when he was asked, because we were all curious, you know, how'd you get here? That was part of his journey. Uh, but really, we were curious, you know, well, tell us 
how did you, uh, what was your religious background before that? And he said, well, my father, we lived in a mud hut in the bush country of Nigeria. I mean, that's just kind of stereotypical, but he said it was true. And he said, um, in our little mud hut, in one of the corners of it, my father had fashioned an idol. And I don't remember if he said if it was a stone of wood, uh, metal, exactly what. Uh, I don't know that it looked like this, but when you search... Um, you know, do a Google image search on Nigerian idols. Uh, this is one of a particular bush country of people in Nigeria. I don't know if, again, that paralleled to his experience or not, but I'm just using that for illustrative purposes. But Doka said, we had that idol set up, and my daddy would say, that's what we worship. And he said, but I'd go out at night, and this is what I always tried to imagine, you know, imagine a place, he said, no electricity, bush country of Africa, and look up at the stars. Can you imagine how bright they would be you know, in a setting like that. No artificial street lights or anything, but he said, you know, the stars, the moon would be beautiful. And he said, I knew from the time that I was a little boy that it didn't make sense that I could see all of that and go back in my hut and hear my daddy say, that's our God that made everything. He said, that just didn't make sense. And you're right, it doesn't. It still doesn't uh, today. And uh, so he said, you know, I began just to want to try to find out more about God. And this is where providence, um, I believe, works in the case of those who actually search for God. He said, I was walking just one of the back paths from one village to another, maybe going into a little bit of a more urbanized area, if you can call it that, uh, in the rural part of Africa. And he said, I just saw a little leaflet, a little paper on the ground, and I picked it up. And it had something about, do you want to know who God is? And it talked about the Bible. He said, I had no idea what the word Bible even meant. But it had an address and you could write for more information. And so uh, I went to the post office or whatever they would call, I guess, their postal system. And somehow uh, that started him on his journey with World Bible School and he learned the truth. And uh, to the last of my knowledge, uh, every once in a while, somebody that goes uh, to that area of the country, an alumni or a uh, mutual friend, they'll just kind of say, you know, got to see him, got to touch base with him. So that's neat. Uh, if you go to India, I don't know if Larry saw this when you were in southern India, uh, what, how far down he got, but uh, Brother Don, Sister Kathy may have seen this. This is the largest Hindu temple in the world. Uh, the largest Hindu temple in the world, the Ragna uh, Ranga Swarmi Temple. I'm probably not saying that right uh, as either. In Sirin Anagam, Tamil Nadu, southern India. Uh, it has 155 acres of shrines uh, kind of similar to this one. Uh, there are uh, 21 of these towers, of these Hindu towers, 81 particular shrines and 39 pavilions where the pantheon of Hindu gods are worshipped. When you think about idolatry, you might think of uh, this guy. He's kind of uh, hard to see, blends into the sandstone rock behind him that he's carved out of, but uh, that is uh, the uh, Lei Shan giant Buddha in the Sichuan province uh, in China, on one of the rivers uh, there that you can see it's accessible by land or uh, by river. Uh, they started carving that in around 713 BC, and it took them almost a hundred years to carve this Buddha into the sandstone cliff. It is 233 feet tall, if you can see the scale of that. Uh, that's pretty impressive as it relates to the size uh, of that particular idol. Well, uh, this was really my first experience with idolatry, and this is what I'm describing for you uh, in your workbook. My seventh grade uh, social studies teacher, uh, Miss Wiley, uh, she would, of course, be responsible in teaching social studies to cover a little bit of world religions and things like that. And uh, so she had a guy very similar to this um, that you sometimes see, uh, I most often see him now in Chinese restaurant establishments that I frequent, but uh, he was in my seventh grade social studies class, and I didn't really know what to make of that, but uh, found out as we went through the class, she said uh, that this represented the Buddha. Well, actually, she was wrong. I did a little bit more research uh, on that. This is called the Laughing Buddha, or if you want to be derogatory, it's called the Fat Buddha. That's just what he's called, but he's not really the Buddha at all. In the Chan strand, Chan like not like Mark Schott, but it is actually spelled the same way. The Chan strand of Buddhism, uh, this is known as the, um, he's called by different things, the Maitreya, if I'm saying that word correctly, the Maitreya Buddha, which means according to their particular um, 
understanding or interpretation, this is the Buddha that will come back at the end of the world, not the guy that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, that guy is the guy, the first guy that came, the first Buddha uh, that founded Buddhism, but this guy is the second Buddha that shows up at the end of the world, according to the Chan strand of Buddhism. Well, uh, tonight, uh, when we look at Exodus chapter 20 and we read the verses that we've already read, we might be tempted to look at all of these expressions of idolatry and say, well, whew, Glad that doesn't describe me. I don't have any of those in my house. I'm not making any of that. I'm not going to worship anything like that. Uh, but can we dismiss the commandment that easily? The commandment uh, that we are dealing with uh, tonight is, of course, this one. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. The word here for carve uh, is a verb that means to cut or to hew or to sculpt. And uh, that's... Uh, the word that's used here by Moses in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, to describe that process, uh, which was already, evidently, in uh, common usage, or it was a common practice uh, that long ago. And um, uh, we can understand why in a moment when we turn a little bit later on in the book of Exodus and see what Brother Aaron does. But here, uh, don't make any sort of carved image and the likeness of so uh, these sorts of things. So uh, tonight, what do we learn? What do we take from this? Let's uh, just start with a uh, few basic questions. Does this command prohibit the production of artistic works? What do you think? Is it a prohibition against uh, sculpture or sculpting? Uh, even pottery, I guess, could uh, fall under that category. What do you think? We have a no answer. Nobody wants to agree we got no, so that's a first and a second. The motion carries, but uh, yeah. So uh, it's not a prohibition against artistic, uh, you know, expression in this sense. Uh, rather, it would be a problem when the imagery becomes what? What happens in Exodus 32? Moses is up on the mountain. The people say what? This old Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. You know, maybe... A mountain lion ate him or something. No, they didn't say that, but maybe they thought, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, well, I've got a good idea. Break off the gold earrings from your wives, sons, daughters. Bring them to me. All the people broke off the earrings, brought them to Aaron. He received the gold from their hand. He fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. I'm just uh, maybe scratching my head to wonder, how did Aaron have that capability even to do that? Uh, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me what skill, you know, what expertise he possessed. Uh, you know, it, it might have been like a lot of my Play-Doh creations and other things when I was in elementary school and the teacher would say, make this or whatever, and I would make it and it'd just be a blob. And the teacher would say, what is that? And I'd tell him, oh, yeah, now I see it. Well, yeah, you know, of course you do. Uh, but evidently they were able to tell uh, what it was. Uh, I cut you off there in verse 4. But this is your God. That's the pronouncement that Aaron makes. O Israel that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, taking a step back, reading what you would have read if you had got to this point in the Exodus journey, and as Moses records it for us, seeing what they had saw and having the you know, awesome experience of watching God's power on display both in Egypt and at the Red Sea at Sinai previously, doesn't this just sound like the most absurd and ludicrous statement? This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They build an altar before it, verse 5, if you keep reading. They're going to have, and this is one of those uh, times when our English versions kind of confuse us, and uh, Carol could help us with this, or maybe even uh, share in our frustration. Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. Feast of the Lord, well, probably the word here generically, they're using that for a synonym for this Idol. So they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Uh, some old preachers like to really jump up and down and make a stand on that particular verse, on particular vices of the past, but we're leaving that aside. Uh, God, knowing that it's all happening, you know, while Moses is unaware, he's up on the mountain, he's out of sight, they think, and out of mind. And uh, go down, Moses. They've turned aside quickly out of the way that I've commanded them. They've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, if I were Moses and God had said that to me, I might have been tempted to rebuff and say, What? No, God, that can't be right. I mean, these people are silly and they're, you know, 
temperamental and uh, they're, yeah, they complain a lot, but surely they've not done that. Well, if Moses had those thoughts, he didn't share them with the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. God even goes so far as says, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I'll make you a great nation. Uh, Moses here has presented what some might call an opportunity of a lifetime. I'll start over and I'll start with you and you'll be the head honcho. But Moses pleaded, he interceded for the people and um, he offers uh, a chance uh, not for God to recant or to change his mind but to show something of his character interceding for them and God relents and turns from the harm that he had intended uh, down to verse 14. Moses comes down the mountain and uh, they are here. Joshua said, you know, it's the noise of war. No, it's uh, something worse than that. Moses' anger is hot. We talked about this last week and he throws the tablets down, broke them at the foot of the mountain. Where he, whether he was trying to hit the calf or his brother or whatever, we don't know, but he broke the commandments in his anger and frustration. He took the calf which they had made, burned in fire, and ground powder, scoured, uh, little, little, it's a lot of words, ground it, and uh, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. Now, here's where it gets really even more unbelievable. Moses said to Aaron, Why, uh, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Did they coerce you? Did they, you know, pour, point a knife at you or a sword? Uh, you know, what was it that compelled you to do this terribly foolish thing? Here's Aaron's excuse. Don't let the anger of my Lord become hot. It already is. You know the people that they are set on evil, for they said, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man brought us out of the land of Egypt. We don't know what has become of him. So, you know, I told them if they had gold uh, cast to break it off. So they gave it to me. And here's, again, the absurdity. I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. It just jumped out. Well, who believes that? Nobody believes that. Because, of course, Aaron had to have some uh, part in it. But I just threw it in the fire and out jumped the calf after that. Well, the imagery, of course, became sinful when they attributed to it a godlike status, when they worshipped it, when they, uh, you know, gave it some significance beyond just a work of art, uh, if you will. That's, of course, the sin that's being prohibited. Uh, when you turn later in the Old Testament, and this is really just by way of introduction to get us to the New Testament, but if you'll go quickly, we won't take time to read all of these verses, but if someone wants to be at Isaiah 44 and someone else at Jeremiah chapter 10, the latter half of Isaiah chapter 44, as you kind of scan down through there, if you've not read it lately, or Jeremiah 10, 1 to 16 lately, uh, just give that a quick, quick glance and someone share with me a, an observation or a comment that both Isaiah and Jeremiah are trying to make about the folly of idol making and idol worship. Do you see anything there that jumps out? Okay, yeah. Uh, he's going to cut down verse 44 or verse 14 of chapter 44. Isaiah says, He cuts down cedars from himself, takes the cypress of the oak, secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn. So he needs some firewood to stay warm. He will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. And then, just so we don't miss the point, he burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, oh, I am warned. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. His carved image. He falls down before it and worships it. Prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my god. I mean, uh, just the absur absurdity of all of it is stupefying. It's just uh, almost more than here. Uh, what even God as he uh, might be inspiring Isaiah to write can hardly believe, and the same is true uh, today. They do not know, they do not understand. Um, they are uh, these foolish people carried away with idolatry. Well, what about Jeremiah? What does he say? Okay, learn not the way of the heathen or the Gentiles. In other words, uh, these are people unacquainted with God whose behavior you are imitating. And again, he says, one cuts a tree from the forest with his axe, and they decorate it with silver and gold. Uh, they do all of these other things. And then, uh, beginning in verse 5, uh, they are upright like a palm tree, talking about the idol they fashion. 
For they cannot speak, they must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do good. They are dull-hearted and foolish, verse 8. A worthless doctrine is a wooden idol, uh, verse number 8. And uh, just again and again, over and over, uh, he's talking about how foolish it is to worship that, uh, something that you yourself have made. To worship something that you yourself are, as it were, responsible for. Now, again... There, summarize it. Yep. Dutch shall say to them that gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Yep. And so uh, they are powerless. I don't have it for you, and I meant to look it up, and I didn't, somehow I put that in my noggin, but I didn't put it on my piece of paper, so I forget exactly the reference uh, to it. But you remember um, one of the prophets, it may be Jeremiah, some of you can cross-reference it more quickly looking it up on your phone, said it's like a scarecrow in a cucumber field. Verse 5, okay. What chapter? Oh, oh Jeremiah 10, verse 5. I knew it was in there somewhere. And so uh, the idea uh, that they're utterly useless, that they're utterly, uh, you know, um, of no value at all. Um, in your workbook, I can just read this quickly to you if you've not read it already. Uh, Burton Kaufman says it like this. The reasons for this, that is the reason for this command and its prohibition of idolatry and idol creation are profound. By its very nature, any religious image is false. Think about that. Any religious image is false. Being a lying presentation of what is allegedly represented. How can that which is material represent anything spiritual? I'll ask you to think about that in a moment. But how can that which is helpless represent eternal omnipotence? How can that which decays represent eternal life? How can that which is not intelligent represent omniscience? How can that which is dumb, unfeeling, blind, and dead represent any of the vital realities of God and holy religion? In other words, he says it's an impossibility. Now, uh, one thing that we could say, how can anything material represent anything spiritual? John will answer that question for you in John 1 and again in 1 John 1. The only way that the material universe could have any expression of the immaterial spirit, eternal God, is through whom or by whom? Christ, that which we have seen with our eyes, we've handled with our hands, which we have heard the word of life, that's what we proclaim to you. In him, uh, that is, was life. The life was the light of men because the word was not only with God, the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's just kind of throwing all of those passages together. So Jesus is the only way to represent the immaterial, spirit, eternal, infinite God when he came and took on flesh uh, as the, if we want to call him, the God-man. So uh, do not make for yourselves any graven image. Well... Uh, on the back page of your handout, you'll find um, a statement here by uh, William Barclay. Actually, not so much as a statement, but just a, a little turn of phrase that he used called the paradox of idolatry. The paradox of idolatry. And by that, he means things fashioned to be reminders of God can very easily turn into a God. Now, you kind of have to or you need to appreciate why he's probably writing this in the way that he does. Uh, he was a, well, at different stages of his life, I guess, uh, could be described different ways, uh, spiritually speaking. Uh, but he, by and large, was opposing a lot of uh, the Anglican, um, I won't say opposing, but he was not a fan of uh, the Church of England. He's writing in Great Britain. Uh, his newspaper articles appear and they're collected in what's called the Daily Study daily Bible study series, a set of commentaries, but uh, he was more of a free church kind of guy, but uh, Episcopalianism, as it's known in this country, the Church of England, they like their icons, not nearly as much as maybe Orthodox and uh, Catholic groups, but anyway, all of that aside, he said the paradox of idolatry. What are you talking about? In Numbers 21, God sent fiery serpents in and among the people because they had rebelled against him. And the people cry out for deliverance. And uh, when they were being bit and dying, the people come to Moses. We have sinned, so they're willing to repent. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may uh, take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, so listen carefully, this is God's instruction. 
If Moses had thought of this presumptuously on his own, the story would have probably turned out much differently than it does. The Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent. Now, how do you give a serpent a fiery you know, appearance in the way that you fashion it? Well, uh, I'm not artistic enough to guess. Maybe some of you with a more vivid imagination or artistic bent, you could explain that to me sometime. Whatever the case, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. There's the material that he used. So maybe that fiery aspect has to do with the way that the bronze would shimmer in the sunlight. Perhaps. I, know, I don't know with certainty. He put it on a pole. So it was if a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now oftentimes this passage is cited to uh, help us understand you know, how the Bible uses uh, our response to God in regards to faith and what faith entails. Uh, faith isn't simply believing something. It also means just, uh, it means more than just believing something. It means believing what God has said and then taking the action He prescribes to show that we believe in what He says. And so uh, if God said, you know, look at the serpent and live, you could stay in your tent and say, well, I believe that. But if you never went out and looked at the serpent, you'd die of the snake bite. It was only for those who believed and who took action. Of course, then we bring that into the New Testament. We talk about our response to the gospel. We believe it, and we show that we believe it by responding to the commands God gives us uh, in connection uh, to our uh, obedience uh, to Christ. But here, um, of interest, again, God tells Moses, this is what I want you to make, this is what I want you to do, this is how I'm going to affect healing, and he does. And seemingly, the story just continues on from that. The children of Israel moved on, camped at Obah. It's just kind of a, a story, and we uh, kind of just leave it there, and we say, well, what happened? Go all the way over some centuries later. How many centuries later? That's of some debate. Most people would say uh, in excess of 600 years later. Again, uh, we have no time date stamps in Scripture. Um, sometimes we do have kind of date stamped uh, about other historical events that we can correlate. But uh, especially in the Old Testament, it's hard to uh, always have an exact date for what's going on. But Hezekiah is king of Judah. He begins to reign, and he is one of the good kings of Judah, the southern tribes. He starts out on some religious reforms. The Bible says, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. These are, um, term, uh, this is terminology for how the Canaanite false gods would be worshipped. Uh, in these high places, usually on mountaintops, they would have sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image. Sometimes they were referred to as Asherah pole or Ashtoreths, uh, depending on which deity uh, was in play, and broke in pieces. Notice this just shows up kind of out of the blue. Broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. You say, well, what in the world's that about? You have to go back to Numbers uh, chapter 21. The bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan, uh, which literally just means in Hebrew, the bronze thing. If I've done my translating correctly, the bronze thing. And they burned incense to it. Well, long before Christ, these people had a desire to worship. Absolutely. Man will always worship something. There are those today who like to say, well, you know, I'm too intelligent to worship any god. You know, I believe in science or whatever, but you will worship something. You will give your devotion to something. And like we talked about last week, you'll become like the god you worship. So that's why it's vitally important that we worship that which is right, which is true, which is uh, God our creator. Uh, but here... Uh, this bronze serpent shows up again, and the children of Israel have been burning incense to this bronze thing. And uh, so it had become an idol, a, a snare to them. Now, um, I just kind of made a, a note to maybe ask, um, do you think that there are something or things similar to that elsewhere in the Bible? Are there any other examples of this sort or type in the Bible? Kind of Bible trivia time. When people took something that they wanted to say represented God, but then it turned into almost like a God, little g, God itself or an idol. Anybody remember what uh, Gideon does after he wins his victory in the book of Judges? Offered the first thing he saw when he got off to God. 
Actually, that's Jephthah. That's a little bit later, but you're close. Gideon uh, uh, is going to finally, you know, vanquish the Midianites. And, of course, that's with the help of God. And uh, the people want Gideon to become their king. In essence, this is Judges chapter 8. If you're wondering where I'm at, rule over us, verse 22, your son. Your grandson also, you've delivered us from the, land, from the hand of Midian. Nope, not going to do it, Gideon said. The Lord shall rule over you. So that sounds like a good answer. But then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment. Each man threw into, the, into it the earrings from his plunder. And the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. If I did my math correctly, at least uh, one measurement would say this would work out to about 50 pounds of gold, give or take, again, depending on how you value a shekel. So about 50 pounds of gold, that's a pretty substantial amount. Beside the crescent ornaments, pendants, purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, besides the chains that were around their camel's necks, then Gideon made it, that is, this collection of gold, into an ephod and set it up in his city, Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. Was that his intention originally? I don't know. Played the harlot. That sounds, of course, you know what that language is suggestive of. But if you read the Old Testament, you will find that idolatry is often couched in those very, what we would say today, loaded terms of sexual unfaithfulness or infidelity. It became a snare to Gideon and his house. So that was the example I thought of. Uh, I wonder, and it's not addressed, and this would be something I don't know that we could reach any consensus on. It would be merely our speculation. But um, if you've read the Old Testament carefully, um, I would suppose, or I would maybe ask you to uh, maybe give some thought to, or at least pose uh, in question form like this, do you think the children of Israel ever used the Ark of the Covenant like an idol? Remember the Ark of the Covenant? Indiana Jones finds it? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I've got to put Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford, and all of it with it. But uh, the Ark of the Covenant, that gold chest, angels on top, God said to make it, put it in the most holy place, the holy of holies in the tabernacle, carried about. uh, You know, there's the stuff inside it, the tablets, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, a jar of manna. Uh, If you read, uh, for instance, I'm thinking of the incident in 1 Samuel uh, chapters 3 to 5, uh, pretty much, um, God had deserted his people. Uh, Eli was a wicked priest. He had wicked sons who were more wicked than he was. Samuel was just in kind of the beginning stages of his uh, work as priest. And so the children of Israel said, well, if we go out to battle, we've got to take the ark with us. But they use it kind of like a good luck charm, almost. They say, well, if we take it out there, you know, we'll surely be victorious. Guess what? Word comes back to Eli and Your sons are dead. The ark's been captured. He falls off his chair backward, breaks his neck, and dies. He's a little bit overweight. The Bible gives us that detail as well, but he's an old guy. Uh, Now the ark of the covenant is put in the house of Dagon, the false idol, uh, false god of the Philistines, and the idol falls face forward in front of it twice. Uh, The second morning they wake up and see uh, its hands are broke off. So it's really interesting to kind of explore all that, but they kind of have it like almost a good luck charm, the lucky rabbit's foot, if you will, And um, maybe, uh, you know, they used it at other times like that. And, of course, that's what Hollywood picked up on as the plot. Uh, You know, Harrison Ford had to rescue it before the Nazis could use it for improper purposes. But let's go on. So here's maybe the thought before we turn to the New Testament tonight. What about other religious icons, paintings, crucifixes, sculptures, and such such like? We don't know anything of, um, I, um, I always want to say, iconography. Uh, iconogra- iconography, yeah, and that's kind of a good way to say it. Icon, like the icon on your computer or phone, is the Greek word for idol. But in Orthodox traditions, um, Greek and otherwise, starting with Greek and going forward, and in, of course, Catholic uh, system and tradition, uh, there is the use of different uh, sorts of visual, physical objects to represent certain aspects uh, of God. And most notably, maybe most famously, uh, is the crucifix, which is just a depiction uh, of a man sculpted on a cross, intended, of course, to represent uh, Jesus. And uh, you've seen those uh, from time to time. 
Uh, if you visited, I remember this again goes back, uh, I told you Buddha was maybe my first introduction to idolatry. If we classify this with idolatry, I do actually remember visiting an uncle uh, who had had um, some type of problem or surgery procedure at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville. And guess what's in every room of St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville, hanging on the wall? A crucifix. Uh, funny story about that, Amy, I'm going to go ahead and tell it. Uh, Amy's grandmother, who uh, gave birth to what would become uh, four gospel preachers who preached all over the world, uh, she was transported uh, to St. Thomas Hospital from I guess uh, our little local hospital in Gainesboro, and um, she was in very serious condition, actually passed away in that hospital uh, later, but she kind of roused up once she arrived there and was surveying her surroundings, and she looked at the wall and saw that, and uh, the nurse and the doctor were in there, and she pointed out to them in a very, what I've been told, a very stern fashion, she said, don't think you'll make a Catholic out of me. And, uh, you know, she was vivacious to the end. But anyways, uh, you know, those sorts of things, um, are they prohibited by this command? I think so. I think that they are under uh, that uh, sort of prohibition because, again, they're trying to represent something that cannot be represented. Now, where we get into trouble is, can I, and I did that, it's on the front, I don't, yeah, here it is. Can I do what I did tonight or what I did in your workbook? There are some people who think that, you know, having... This cross, like I've got it on the front of your workbook, is a violation of this command. Uh, there are those who say that you can't have any representation of Jesus like in a children's classroom setting. Um, to me, I'm not of the opinion that this command is a violation of that or that activity. Mm-hmm. That is a good discussion that I, I don't know that we could fully flesh out tonight in the time we have remaining, but God has set up memorials for us, things uh, to remember by. Uh, and so maybe some of it has to do with our intent, uh, even in those matters. What are we intending? Uh, when God told them to pile up stones, don't cut them, uh, to leave them as they were, kind of as He had fashioned them, maybe to take away that tendency to uh, you know, take credit or beautify uh, and Maybe sometimes uh, there are those who would even use a building uh, where we can assemble for the purpose of worshiping God, but it becomes almost as an idol when you decorate it ornately or so on and so forth. So uh, it's an interesting idea. Um, this, I think, you know, uh, Jesus never said, don't be an idolater. But it was clear that was his thoughts on the matter because uh, he lived uh, as a first century uh, Jew under uh, the Old Testament law of Moses. So even though he didn't say it, uh, plenty of other passages uh, testify that idolatry is forbidden in every form uh, by uh, the teaching of the New Testament and the covenant of Christ. Acts 15, uh, the Gentile believers are told idols are off limits. That was a bigger problem for them then in that historical setting than it was for the Jewish Christians. Uh, Galatians 5 verse 20, it's a work of the flesh. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 9, uh, about meat sacrificed to idols. Paul has three chapters there in the Corinthian correspondence where he kind of has to work that out. And he said, we know an idol's nothing, but don't give it any credit, don't give it any worship. You've lived long enough, Peter says, in idolatry. Don't go back to it. And John just simply says, keep yourselves from idols. And I, I like that last little phrase there in 1 John 5, 21, keep yourselves from idols. Well, what kind of idols, John? Are you talking about Diana at Ephesus? Are you talking about uh, Zeus in... Um, Athens or Apollo or what idol, uh, idols are you referencing? Well, probably all of those, but also anything else. Because uh, today, yes. I know you've done a lot of reading. What do you think is the most unusual idol you've ever run into? Uh, the most unusual. If you study Hinduism, and Brother Don could speak to this more than I can, there's some wild stuff in Hinduism. 
And um, they would all say that they are sub-gods of Krishna and Vishnu, but I don't want to even go down that road because it's very weird how they intermingle certain, what do we say, physical activities with the worship of their God. That's maybe the generic way to say it. And that's nothing new. They did that in Ephesus too and in Corinth, if you've studied uh, the first century world as well. But do people still make and worship idols in 21st century America? Do your head like this. In your workbook, with purposeful irony, uh, I asked the uh, Microsoft uh, Artificial Intelligence chatbot. Victor told us a little bit about that, and I know some of you said, what in the world that is? Don't worry if you don't know what it is. Don't worry about it. But you probably are more familiar with the TV program American Idol. That was what they named it. It came on uh, in June 2002 after Adrian was born in May. I remember that's how I can associate the start of that TV show. But I asked um, our uh, you know, technologically advanced um, time period and um, software and other available tools we have. Uh, what are examples of modern idol worship? And they it spit, it, uh, spit out these seven for us. Celebrity culture. Uh, I don't get that one. Maybe some of you do. Uh, I don't care what somebody in Hollywood does. I just It doesn't matter to me. Some people uh, worship that. Materialism and consumerism, that one hits all of us pretty well square between the eyes, especially in the good old U.S. of A., Technology and social media, uh, you know, if we want to, again, just keep stomping on toes, how much time do you give to social media each week? How much time do you give to Bible study? Answer on your own. Uh, number four has certainly uh, come to play in the last, um, at least in the elections of my lifetime, voting age, at least, nationalism and political figures. We'll see plenty of that as November approaches. Self-image and perfection. I make that an idol, how I present myself and curate my image or brand. Sports and fandom, yeah, that's easier to say since it's not football season, right? But that's an idol. Science and technology, you know, and you could go on and on. And I like this little quote that it spit out at the end. Remember that idol worship isn't limited to religious statues. It permeates our daily lives. Reflect on what you hold in high regard and consider whether it has become an idol. I think that's pretty sound advice. I think that's exactly what John was saying in 1 John 5, 21, uh, when he says, you know, keep yourselves from idols. So uh, there's a, a trio of questions there that you can answer uh, about agreeing or disagreeing, different age groups. Maybe something affects you more at a certain stage in life than others. And uh, while we didn't have time tonight to, uh, to look at it in depth or in detail, uh, I would call your attention and ask for your own personal study later when the Bible says uh, that this prohibition against idolatry was given because the God we serve is a jealous God. A jealous God. Jealous is ne there not a sinful or negative quality whatsoever. Uh, it's a very stringent quality, though, that describes the holiness that our God possesses and that He expects us to possess as we seek to serve Him. Well, as always, our class is much too short, but that's the way it goes. Uh, look at uh, commandment number three for uh, next week, and the Lord willing, we'll be together then to consider it together. Thank you for your good attention tonight.